When it comes to America's Cup secrets, daggerboard details are top of the list. Get their design right and winning will look easy. Get it wrong and each lap of the course will feel like riding a velodrome on flat tyres. So how do Cup foils work and what are the designers trying to achieve? One real performance area where we can uh, you know, differentiate ourselves and hence we put all our research is the dagger boards and the wetted surface and drag that they entail. The holy grail clearly probably is to try and get these boats to, to do a complete lap of the course without ever touching down. To understand a, a sailboat at a really, really fundamental level is we are trying to extract energy from two fluids that are moving at different speeds. So we have wind blowing across the water and we have effectively two aircraft wings. One operates in the air, which is the big wing sail we see, and the opposite one which opposes those loads in the water. For the boat, you know, the boat weighs about three tonnes with all the sailors on board, so we're, we're lifting that out of the water. The second load we're trying to do is the wing sail is trying to push the boat sideways, and so the, the vertical part of the board has to resist that force. Essentially, this kind of S-shaped foil that's evolving and, and most of the teams seem to, to have got there, that is simply moving the lift from the wing further outboard on the boat. And so my lift is here, my, my weight of my boat is here, and the distance between those two times the weight of the boat essentially is the writing moment. So I get more stability. It probably also comes with some drag penalty. So these are where we make the trade-offs. We're seeing boats that foil in much lighter wind, so we can kind of have less, less power. Um, so we have to make them more efficient. Um, to make them more efficient, to, to foil at slower speeds. The physical evolution that you could kind of look at and see is that the span of the wings is comparatively much, much longer than we had back in the 72s. That's putting a lot of difficult work on the structural engineers. We've got this longer, skinnier, more flexible, harder to control kind of foils. The, the very lightest conditions, we need to be able to race between six knots of wind and 25 knots of wind. Six knots of wind, we really can't fly the hull. So we're two hulls in, uh, we're very slow, it's, it's pretty painful. Things happen very, very quickly from there on up. You know, about half a knot of wind later, more wind, and suddenly we have a hull flying, and you know, our speed might go from six or seven knots to 10, 11, 12 knots, like a lot, lot faster suddenly. And then another half knot or a knot later, we're suddenly we're up and foiling. And so we have this, these huge kind of transitions to, to navigate. And the sort of optimal foil for each of those modes will be quite different. So that's quite hard to manage across the, the very light air end of the spectrum. One of the things we're allowed to do in the class this time that we weren't in the 72s is apply what we call rudder differential, but that is have a difference in lift from the leeward side of the boat to the windward side of the boat on the rudder. And you can kind of think of that as the windward rudder kind of pulling down on the boat, which is in a way a little bit like adding crew weight or you know, more riding moment, making the boat more stable. As a general kind of rule of thumb, you could kind of say a less stable foil that's harder to control is probably got less drag associated with it. But if we can't sail it in a kind of nice, stable, accurate kind of way, then that's probably not fast either. So for each board, once it's uh, sort of deployed, we're allowed to rotate it around two axes. The, the secondary axis of cant we can use to sort of modify the orientation of, of the board in a way that perhaps gives us more or less uh, stability. So if we, we can go perhaps from uh, a mode which is uh, very unstable but fast uh, to a more stable, easier to sail kind of mode. And can the guy when he's driving the boat look around and get his head out of the boat and see the gusts coming? Or is the board so tricky to sail that it requires his complete focus? Because of the number of boards, we're, we're constrained by the protocol. And that says we're allowed to build six boards for our 45-foot test platforms, and then finally four boards for the uh, race boat. On top of that, we're allowed to make a certain number of changes. But effectively, for each one of those boards we build, we can make one change to it up to 30% of its, of its weight, which is actually a pretty significant change. Give or take, it's, it's about a three-month process to, uh, to build um, a board. And so if you start counting back from uh, the racing period, giving yourself some time to learn that board and understand it, you know, how to use it in the, in the best way possible, and, uh, and then put the three-month building process uh, in front of that. Inevitably, there's a the kind of process of discovery in, it, in a way that's kind of the fun part of the, of, of the job is you, you do all the theoretical work, you put it on the boat, and without fail, you know, there's, there's some aspect of the performance or design or behaviour that's kind of a surprise and, and something to learn from. Meanwhile, as five teams were getting to grips with their foils in Bermuda's Great Sound, one was still on its way. 
Emirates Team New Zealand had opted to conduct its testing and development on home waters in Auckland, keeping their secrets to themselves as long as possible. We've finished loading the main deck, everything fits, and it is a big relief. This is the push to the top of the mountain for us, and uh, yeah, I'm getting pretty excited. It does, this is where it, it doesn't take much to get you you motivated when you when you realise what's at stake now and, and, and where we're at, you know, because I know we're gonna be we're gonna get there, we're gonna be really competitive. 